Turkish civil society has relatively low levels of social capital, which are defined by reference to interpersonal trust, which as we have shown is relatively low level in comparison to other countries, though in the most recent years, by 2014, it seemed to have crept up to the levels of Latin American countries, which is not very high. So we can assume that there is low interpersonal trust. However, when the probes are made about acquaintances, friends, friendship networks, etc., that picture changes and the interpersonal trust starts to increase to relatively higher levels, perhaps of moderate trust levels under those circumstances. But still we can assume that interpersonal trust is relatively scarce. Social tolerance, as this picture indicates is considerably low when asked in surveys who would you not like as neighbor and various dissenting figures are presented such as people from other race, criminals, drinkers, unstable people other religions such as Christians and Jews, foreign workers, those who have contracted AIDS, drug addicts, homosexuals, some of these are considered as being stigmatized social roles in society. We get a picture that Turkish performance which is indicated in this dark line is very high as you can see. So the Turkish performance, except for um, South Korea on certain cases and Saudi Arabia, seems to be considerably low, especially in comparison to this group of countries, um, which include North America, Canada and the United States, as well as Indonesia, Vietnam, etc., Southeastern Asia, also some Latin American countries such as Mexico and Argentina, South Africa and Spain, some southern European countries such as Spain seem to be very, very low so far as social tolerance is concerned. Or social intolerance is high. This indicates that social capital is relatively low and it results in establishment of associations or corporations that mainly emphasize primordial ties such as lineage or blood relations brothers, sisters coming together, establishing corporations and running them, whether they are economic corporations or social or political, they tend to be relatively well established in these kinds of primordial ties. Also, Territorial ties, which are also primordial, which in Turkey is referred to as Hemşehri ties, ties from the same city, vicinity uh, of birth and a place of living. Religious ties tend to be emphasized in the establishment of these kinds of corporate bodies or associations. Therefore, associability tends to be restricted severely 
by these kinds of relationships and partnerships are relatively difficult to establish and after establishment to sustain. In a famous book written by Francis Fukuyama called Trust about 10 years ago, he argued that there is a three generation rule for family firms. And indeed, many family firms have come and gone, some of them terribly successful, but collapsed within a generation or two. So a member of the family establishes a corporation, usually a male member of the family, let's say a grandfather, passes the family on to his son or daughter, and then the son and daughter passes it to his or her offsprings, and in that process, the family firm collapses. This has been more or less a general pattern throughout the world. There are stellar examples of it. For example, how many of you know the Wang Computer Camp Company? Anybody? I'm not surprised. OK. How many of you know the international business machines? as a computer company. Goody, see? And again, I'm not surprised. Because the Van Corporation no longer exists. Van Corporation was established a little before the IBM by Mr. Wang, a Chinese-American, very successful company, had been in the computer business for a while. And international business machines were established by a number of computer engineers from north of New York. And they established this partnership company and ran it effectively and efficiently, as opposed to Mr. Wang, who passed this corporation on to his son, who was not fully endowed in entrepreneurial acumen as his father, and he couldn't manage the affairs of the company properly, and more of it you can read in Fukuyama's book, The Company Collapsed. So family firms are not very stable associations as such, as a result of which partnership based on primordial ties are not easy to sustain or carry over through one generation to the next, and they often in this conveyor belt of succession collapses. As a result of which, Turkish economic growth had not been very successful for a long period of time until slowly in the 21st century, Turkish corporations started to move out of this primordial ties and are very slowly and painstakingly becoming more professional. And this is a very slow process, and which in part explains the relative economic underdevelopment of the Turkish economy under these circumstances as well. Well, so far as the reflection of all of this to Turkish politics is concerned, we observe that there is relatively high levels of political efficacy. Its distribution is almost like a normal curve. These are attitudes towards politics, and we ask through several questions, eight of them, as to how people think they are influential on the political decisions that are made in the central government in the country. Um, and the response is given when amalgamated into one overall index of political efficacy to questions such as, most of the time I feel as if my life is run by forces I cannot control, I agree, disagree. I can do things that influence the decisions of the government in Ankara, I agree, disagree. Turkey is run by a few elites who are not sensitive to the feelings of the people, again, I agree, disagree. 
these responses and similar others, eight questions, when they are composed into one single index through a factor analysis run, you get this distribution which tend to in indicate that more people, as you can see here, around six and seven, and the modal response is six, seem to feel quite efficacious, that they can influence things that are happening in the center of the country. And the mean is also around five. Most seem to be arguing that they are quite influential in how things are run. And that seems to indicate that there is a certain attitude towards political participation. And it looks as if more people think that, especially through voting and other processes, they can be of some kind of influence on how things move, which we will see next week, whether that assumption to a certain extent is true or not, and what kind of political participation it creates in the country. But in essence, interest articulation in Turkey flows through these four different types of associations into politics, and their effectiveness vary greatly from type of association to type of association. First, we may refer to the voluntary types of highly formalized, institutionalized associations which are established to articulate certain interests. For example, business interests by Türk Sanayicileri ve İş Adamları Derneği, for example, TÜSİAD, Turkish Big Business, or Müstakil İş Adamları Derneği, Sanayicileri ve İş Adamları Derneği, which is the conservative or the Islamist or political Islamist version of it, which was established much later. This was established in 1970. If I'm not mistaken, Musiyar was established in the 1990s. Then you have other um, similar organizations. I have not, of course, listed all the names. There are many, many of those. Um, there is the young uh, industries and um, Businessmen and women's associations, they are called Giat, Tugiat, or, or Bugiat, Kogiat, whatever, depending on the province where they are effective, uh, for example. And there are many of these. They have a secretariat, they have a web page, email, a postal address where you can send a snail mail or send an email message contact them. They have annual meetings, reports, various research activities, various efforts at influencing the government, and their business is to articulate business interests. Now there are also trade unions as opposed to business organizations in Turkey, but they have also shown a very interesting trajectory of change over time these um, uh, trade union activism increased from 1960s with a new law that was promulgated in 1963, as I've told you many times before, by Bülent Ecevit's um, labor ministry, was effective in promulgating this law. That had created a relatively active trade unionism in, in the country. In 1980, when the coup took place, there were 3.5 million members of trade unions of the land at the time. This was the number of unionized labor. Out of about 5 million workers in Turkey, Approximately, approximately 5 million, maybe a little over. Very high level of unionization, as you can see. In 2014, on the 29th of January, minister in charge of labor activities in Turkey, the labor minister, Mr. Faruk Celik, declared that there were a total of 
one million ninety-six thousand card-carrying members of trade unions in Turkey as of 2014, Jan January 29th. So we would assume that this is the figure for 2013, the very end of 2014. Out of 11 and a half million approximately workers in Turkey. Approximately 9%. So it dropped from about 70% to about, or say, two-thirds of the labor to about less than 10% of the labor. So there are, according to the minister's declaration, 115 trade unions in Turkey. As of the beginning of 2014 in this declaration. So that indicates the kind of change the trade unions have gone through in Turkish economy and politics. Therefore, the weight and the power and political efficacy of trade unions have dropped dramatically from 1980 until now. Most of labor is not unionized. They cannot protect their rights. They cannot promote their interests as they had done so in the past, as effectively. It looks as if the labor unions were really scaled down after the military coup tremendously. And this is, to a certain extent, hailed as creating flexibility for the Turkish market. But at the same time, this comes at a huge cost of workers' rights and human rights in the working conditions of the Turkish manufacturing industry uh, and also in mining, which we see many examples of disastrous performances, especially in the recent months. Also in the construction industry, also very near our campus, shipbuilding industry, we have seen many examples of almost an epidemic of accidents causing lethal outcomes, deaths of workers in many numbers. And since their numbers have dwindled, since they can't increase their effectiveness and control over the labor, they were not able to press the, their corporations who employ them to strictly follow the international labor organization's codes and establish the kind of environment secure environment in which the labor should perform. And this tells you about the kind of imbalance between the power of the business versus the workers in the Turkish political system. Then, of course, there are several other non-economic voluntary organizations. I've given some of the examples. These, some of these are political, such as TÜSES, which is social democratic. Turkish Democracy Foundation, which is a conservative, uh, liberal conservative get-together. Um, and to serve is the umbrella organization for the third sector or civil society associations in Turkey and the like. Then there are associations in Turkey known as Dernek. Some of them are professional such as Siyasi İmler Türk Derneği or Bilim Akademisi, I'm giving examples from my, my own life, or Democratic Yargı or Yarsav in the field of, for example, judiciary. Um, those that end with V are foundations. The others are just associations. Then there are many examples of territorial, sports, charity, and religious and solidarity associations. Among them, sports and charity and religious associations are the dominant types of associations that we have emanating from these primordial ties. Sports associations are usually an outgrowth of territorial ties also, Hemşeri networks. These sports clubs are clubs of certain provinces or certain locations, such as Rizespor, 
or Konya Spor or Gaziantep Spor. They are known by the names of the provinces or the major cities of these provinces. And they're supported by these Hemshehri solidarities, these territorial solidarities as such. Also, smaller localities of smaller towns. Akisar Belediye Spor, for example, is another example. It's not a provincial, it's just a small town in Manisa. Became very successful in Turkish football or soccer. And then we have many examples of sports clubs. Uh, in non-soccer activities, these sports clubs also uh, come out of, say, universities, for example. And they are not fully primordial, more professional in their origins, but they are different type of solidarity associations as such. These are non-professional associations. As you can see, they, they, they are not out of a profession. Uh, but the professions are organized as non-voluntary associations in Turkey in, in the form of chambers of commerce, for example, or chambers of industry or business. Most of them are established by the state regulated closely by the state, run by the state, and um, all of these associations, you know, um, bar associations, medical association, um, or for that matter, engineering associations, architectural associations, all of them are established by law, not by the initiation of the professions, but by the initiation of the state, regulated by the state, kept at vigil by the state, and there is a great effort at manipulating them by the state at the same time. Especially TOB, which is the chamber of all chambers and all exchanges in the country, has about a little more than 400,000 corporations as its members, wields a huge amount of power. As a result, every government is very eager to control it in any way it could. And that, of course, had made it a major um, playing ground or arena of political struggle between the main political parties, especially the government. And some major politicians, such as Professor Najmettin Erbakan, started his political career from that basis. He ran for the office of the chair of this organization. He won the office, but his rival, Mr. Suleyman Demiral, who was the prime minister at the time, challenged his um, election and was able to remove him from that seat and could field a, his protege to replace him in this position which precipitated him to get out of business-related political activity into party politics, per se, after 1969. Now, non-associational interest groups, on the other hand, are poorly organized interest groups. They're not well organized. Often, they are issue-based associations. Ayas Pashi Koruma Derni was established, for example, for a little while. Or uh, these are, some call themselves as volunteers, some call this as initiatives. Gayrettepe, for example, for a while, a, a district of Istanbul had such an initiative. Ayas Pasha had such an initiative against the building of Park Hotel, which was emerging as a gargantuan skyscraper, and they wanted to stop it from being built. They were not successful at it but they were able to um, bring it up as an agenda issue. Eventually, if you are to believe the Turkish press, it was the intervention of Chancellor Kohl of Germany, who thought that a too high a skyscraper right next to the German consulate would be a threat for that building. So he asked the Turkish government to scale down the plans of this skyscraper, which the Turkish government obliged. And they cut off 11 stories 
of that building, which had already been built. And the current Park Bosphorus Hotel, which is very near Taksim, if you visit the place you'll see it, was built in its place right next to the German consulate on down, down the way to Ayaspasha. So um, this initiative seemed to have paid um, some kind of, played some kind of role in Turkish politics, but it, I'm not so sure whether it was their success or the success of some kind of international intermediation that created the outcome of that, uh, of that sort. Well, there is a more recent Valde, Bane, Koruma, Derni, etc., which seems to be active on ecological grounds, trying to protect uh, some green areas, the parks of Istanbul from encroachment of big business, big construction business, which is trying to turn the city into a um, sort of a major project area and treat the entire city as such. And there is reactions to this kind of practice of construction um, without any limits uh, happening in Istanbul uh, as such. So these are examples of non-associational groups. There's one, one issue here, a very specific issue. Protection of Ayaspasha from becoming the target of such a huge project uh, which creates an environmental um, risk for this area and protected as such. Institutional associations are formally established institutions, but they serve other social or political purposes, such as a university or a military or even a corporation, can turn into a political interest group. An interest group articulating a certain interest in the corridors of ministries in Ankara and push for it for the establishment of something of that sort. And then try to protect their benefits or promote their interests uh, through their contacts uh, one way or the other. Military through defense projects also on very many realms in the past had been an, a very effective and powerful interest group in Turkish politics. Less so, but it still is a interest group in Turkish politics, as are all militaries in all political systems, and they have to be reckoned with. Universities also try to play such a role from time to time, especially protecting their whatever is left of their autonomy, um, scientific realms, a free speech and what have you. Um, from time to time, uh, make the headlines, and they try to influence their uh, governments uh, through um, various initiatives of, the, of this nature. So there are many examples of these institutional interest groups. And finally, anomic interest groups in Turkey are also abundant. These are spontaneously organized groups that collectively pressure uh, the authorities um, usually over a certain issue that arises that leads to their frustration. And they usually function as a protest group in most occasions. A typical example is a lynch mob. We occasionally have lynch mobs in Turkey and they do show uh, sensitivities to such things as pedophilia or robbery which was perpetrated by some young people that ended up killing some elderly couple in some small province in um, the middle of Anatolia suddenly leads to a big uproar and a big protest in, in this town as the culprits are caught by the police People attack the police station to get these guys and then lynch them if they could. Um, on most occasions, fortunately, they had not been successful, but there have been incidents where such things occurred from time to time. Um, we do have something similar happening at sports arenas from time to time in Turkey, soccer clubs, etc. 
get involved in this, this kind of protest, especially um, at times when the results of a certain match is debatable. Uh, people think that the referee was not very fair, etc. They show their preference by running after the referee and try to uh, lynch the guy. And this occasionally leads to some kind of uh, injuries. But fortunately, no death so far. Um, so the, these are the sorts of incidents that occur. What you would observe more frequently in Turkey is people who stop, for example, intercity or city traffic because of the death of a elementary school pupil who tries to cross the street, is run over by an intercity bus or a truck or some, something of the sort, and they demand that safe passage for pedestrians for a certain location near an elementary school or a secondary school for their children to cross over with relative security. And they stop traffic until they get their demand recognized by the authorities and they get something that looks like an acceptable promise or commitment by the authorities that they will bid an overpass or an underpass for that part of the intercity road or city road so that the students could go from their homes to, the, to their schools and back in relative safety. So this is the sort of thing that has become um, more recognizable and frequent in times. Um, but these have no leaders. They are spontaneous. And they do not follow any rules by, um, by the law or otherwise. So they are called ruleless. Anomic means um, not abiding by rules. Rulelessness. So they are anomic, anomic groups in the sense that they are spontaneous. And they usually do not last long. After the promise is carried out, they go away. But if in the meantime another mishap occurs, you can see the same kind of reaction being made by that community. And therefore, um, we can argue that they are transient and they don't last very much. Whereas associational interest groups are long lasting, Non-associational interest groups also could wither away if there is a successful solution to the problem. For example, you don't hear of this Ayaspasha initiative any longer because the issue there was resolved one way or the other. Therefore, the raison d'etre for the organization simply withered away. Now, the relationship between these associations and the state and government uh, in Turkey also follows a relatively interesting pattern in which there are some favored associations in the eyes of every government and they are provided special treatment. There are 13 such institutions now, 13 such associations, I'm sorry, which can collect some donations without any previous approval by the government. These 13 are considered to be good associations, GG associations in Turkish. The government likes them very much, are fond of them and wants to promote them. Occasionally they get into, a, into some row due to changes in politics. For example, one of them, Kim Seokmo, was recently taken out of that list because it belonged to a, a closer connection to the Fethullah Gülen Cemaati, therefore it was considered as not GG any longer by the, by the government, and they were put on a back, back list, and they sued the government, they went through an uh, administrative court, and they were able to get a court decision to reinstate them as, as, a, as such an organization. It's through these fights do, do we observe which organizations happen to be in this slot of being most favored. Then there are those who are considered as um, more dangerous and they have to be kept at an arm's distance. They are usually 
ideologically on the other side of the spectrum. And they are not necessarily liked very much. For example, uh, the president of the country in a recent declaration has stigmatized the feminist organizations. He, he doesn't like them. There are two types of women in his eyes, those who are mothers and those who are feminists. And feminists are awful, mothers are good. So this is pretty much indicated in this attitude towards these associations. Therefore, feminist organizations are considered not necessarily that reliable. In fact, a colleague of ours, Dr. Dreisek, has suggested a categorization of associations along these two different criteria. Inclusivity, exclusivity versus passive and active. Passively inclusive, passively exclusive. Exclusion of associations, not very actively, but sort of uh, not taking them into consideration very much. So in the passive case, you don't see some kind of harassment by the authorities, police going after them, uh, tax collectors knocking on their doors every week and what have you. In the passive exclusion, it is usually keeping these um, categories, th this category of associations um, in a list where they are not given much opportunity to share the state budget or to be included in various activities of the sponsored by the state or state funds and what have you. But if they survive, they're all right. They won't be actively prosecuted or persecuted. For, for example, feminists are now here. They're not like very much, but, but they're passively excluded, not actively excluded as such. Passive uh, inclusion will be the case of many religious associations, especially from the Sunni fold, for example, who would again be considered as good organizations, but Nothing is pretty much done to promote their interest as such. Active inclusivity is, for example, rendered to an organization such as the IHH, IHAHA, which for a period of time was able to handle, for example, Turkish foreign policy towards the Middle East. Uh, the famous Mavi Marmara incident uh, that put the lives of many people at risk was carried out by this association and the uh, state was sort of actively supportive of it, although they deny it. But there was, for example, many ministers, including the current Deputy Prime Minister, Mr. Arunj, at Antalya, when they were um, leaving the port, um, bidding them goodbye for this trip. So the state was pretty much involved through its governmental activities in this kind of organizational activity as such. For a long while, uh, the Fethullah Gülen Jamaati was also represented in this category of being highly active and inclusive in their incorporation. Now there certain foundations which are owned and run by the offsprings of major figures, the front bench figures of, this or, of the um, Justice and Development Party, which are also in this kind of close relationship, inclusive relationship, actively inclusive. Active exclusivity is carried out towards most conspicuously towards clandestine, illegal, illegitimate organizations, such as 
Teha KPJ, for example, and for a long time PKK. Now PKK is still excluded, but it's somewhere around here. Very difficult to categorize. Partly actively excluded, partly passively excluded, but in negotiation with the government for settlement of some of the major issues concerning the rights of the Kurds in Turkish society. So as a result of which, it seems to be evolving into some kind of a different type of organization. Again, some of these trade unions are actively inclusive. A Timsem, for example, got part of the action in Milli Eğitim Şurası most recently, so some of these organizations were in there. And uh, some of these were sort of actively excluded, some of these um, trade unions, especially left wing, DISC, for example, seems to be here. Hakish seems to be here. Actively included, actively excluded. DISC is seen as more or less the enemy of the current government and gets an exclusionary treatment, whereas Hakish is seen as part and parcel of the current government's policy and ideology is, is included. What I'm trying to tell you is that this is not a sort of frozen list. It keeps changing with changing times. As the politics of the day changes, organizations move back and forth these, these categories. Currently, this is the sort of distribution you get in the Turkish political system. But in essence, the overall relationship of the government in charge is one of control. And they would like to establish central control and make primacy of politics a major standard by which all kinds of civic activism is related to the state. And state wants to have a very close look at civic activism. For civic activism is considered as a potential for opposition which can undermine the operation of the government party. So all organizations, unless they are in the same ideological and political realm as that of the government of the country, the others are all suspect and they are potentially organizations of treachery, fitna ve fujur. So the government sees all opposition in terms of friend and foe divisions. If you're not a friend of the government, so you are a foe of the government, not a competitor, not an alternative, but an enemy. And that's how you're treated, which takes you back to the article by Fred Fry on the relations between the Turkish political elites. And this is one area where you see this happening very effectively. So as a result of that, what you observe in, in Turkey is either a neo-corporatist or a corporatist type of relationship between the state and the associations of civic activity. So the corporatist idea was an idea of fascism developed originally by Mussolini and his fascists. And they had argued that there has to be representation of the state in each major organization in every sector of the society and economy. So that there'll be corporations built throughout the society. And these corporations were to be controlled, monitored, and closely regulated by the state agencies. And there will be one corporation per sector. So the Automotive manufacturers should have one corporation. Automotive workers should have one corporation. One trade, official trade union, one official union for the business, one official trade union for the workers per sector. And all of them would be monitored and closely controlled by the center, by the state. And this control would seem formally as if the representation of the sector in the state 
Whereas it is just the opposite. It is the state that is represented in that sector of the economy by these corporations. And they are to be accountable to the state. The state is not accountable to the, to the workers or to the employers of a certain economic sector, but it's this sector that is accountable to the state, which ensures that there won't be any labor unrest, no industrial wars between different classes, the employers and the employees. They will all be kept under strict control of the state, and there will be industrial peace, and as much productivity as possible, and as much production as possible, so that there is enough economic growth. So when it was originally established in the 1920s, after the mayhem at the end of the First World War in Italy, it was sort of providing a centralized and totalitarian solution to industrial unrest and industrial disruption in productivity and production in Italy at the time. Now, this model has, of course, changed quite a bit. In the 21st century, in fascistic environments, it is applied the same way. But in modern capitalist environments, you do get these kinds of triangular relationship between the governments, business, and labor, where the government and the business seem to conspire to hold labor under some kind of control through something that looks like a corporatist deal, which is referred to as neo-corporatism since the 1970s which seems to ha occur in a host of countries, especially in Western Europe, in France, in, in Britain, in more so in Germany, that there is this kind of control of these corporations and very close relationship between the government officials and the business representatives in each ministry of the state. And the labor is considered as a major force that needs, that is the most fickle, unreliable actor in the economy and society and has to be kept under some kind of check. And that is done through their collaboration. And in Turkey, not only the labor was disorganized, was, was led to sort of get rid of its organization and therefore become easier to control to hire and fire and control by the business. At the same time, government and business started to collude on policy making and policy running against the labor organizations more effectively. And as labor organizations were divided between those that are to be excluded and those who are to be included in the policy process, and in return for abiding by the rules of the game, they received certain benefits, goodies from the state budget and, and the government. And this leads the government um, to a sort of a centralized control and highly centralized monitoring and regulating of business activity and provides for the basis for something like state capitalism. And in fact, it creates both cronyism and state capitalism at the same time. And the cronious practices seem to be continuing under these circumstances um, in, the, in the Turkish system. So the current form of economic organization also adjusted and adapted itself to the political picture and has become crony capitalism with a strong presence of the state some, com some kind of a state capitalism run from the center by the intervention of the government elites through the enrichment and empowerment of cronies in various sectors of the economy. Most conspicuous and most visible of them are in the construction business, as you very well know. And therefore, the most effective lobby among the businessmen seem to have become the
developers in Turkey, mütahit as they are called, or yüklenici in modern Turkish, mütahit in the Ottoman Turkish. Although it's been used uh, for extensively long period of time. So there's a mütahit association now, which is a non-associational group, although it has its associational um, organizations that seem to be in close connection with the power centers of the government and seem to be very effective in getting their way uh, by establishing certain practices which the government abides by and operates with them. They seem to be in close contact with the president's office, for example, can easily call him up and when they dial up, they'll be answered and there is close relationship between these circles and in recent events, this kind of collusion and working together seem to have emerged very effectively to be visible in the Turkish press and the media as such. And as a result, um, the pinnacle of this organization now has become a uh, construction industry in Turkey and their uh, spokespersons are, the, uh, are represented at the highest levels of the government with the greatest amount of, effect of effectiveness. They are the most actively included group in these various associational pictures that I have tried to depict. And that takes us into the domain of political economy, which we will cover tomorrow afternoon. Up until now, we have laid down the basic structure of the relationship between state and society and polity, in which there is a great demand for centralism and also a great proclivity by the political elites to create centralism to the detriment of local politics and local life, mixed with the idea of primacy of politics, which has been inherited from the Ottoman Empire, produces a neo-patrimonial style of rule, which we have called neo-Hamidianism, which creates a tendency for control over the society, polity, and the economy from the center which through several neo-corporatist designs extends as tentacles of a octopus-like centralized state into the sectors of the economy which is trying to control all manufacturing and labor activism as closely as possible through collusion of interests with cronies that are developed to somehow control and share the, the bounty, the emoluments of the state budget under the control of the central state. Now this is the structure we have already laid down. But from 1920s onwards, of course, Turkish economy has been operating not within its own political context, but also in an international context. So today, we will look into this greater picture of the political economy of Turkey as it evolved from the very beginning with the establishment of, Repub of the Republic in 1923. Now, Turkey agreed to a treaty in the city of Lausanne, Switzerland in 1923, which established the Turkish Republic and also clarified its economic relations with the victorious powers of the First World War and the debtors who had loaned large sums to the Ottoman Empire from 1854, the Crimean War onwards. We had covered that earlier, but time has passed and you might have forgotten. That's why I want to remind you of that. And these had been based on various agreements extended by the Ottoman sultans in a demeanor of largesse in the form of capitulations so as to enable these 
non-Ottoman subjects of other states and empires of Europe to freely work, manufacture, and trade in the Ottoman land. And these capitulations had become rather interesting tools in the hands of the debtors who had loaned the Ottomans after 1854 to create vast economic interests for them. And the new republic considered this as one of the most important bottlenecks that had to be removed before its robust economic growth could, could take place after the establishment of the new state. So they had made sure that these capitulations would, would not be part and parcel of the Republican economic picture. And they successfully negotiated that in the Lausanne. However, they accepted the debt of the Ottomans, which they were to pay with the other states that came out of the Ottoman Empire at the end of 1918. So Turkey was not alone in shouldering the debt of the Ottomans. But the bulk happened to be on the shoulders of the Ottoman Empire, of the debt of the Ottoman Empire was on the Turkish Republic. And eventually the, this debt was serviced or paid by the Turkish Republic into the 1950s. It's been over with. But in this period, the first major goal was to establish, create domestic manufacturing industries by those who were considered to be the main sociological category establishing the state. This is best probably communicated in a German concept. This is more or less the Staatsvolk, the sort of main bulk on which the new state were to be established. And that had been in the back of the head of those who had been managing the affairs of migrants into the society, refugees, settlement, asylum, etc. Sunni Islam is one credential, Turkish speaking is another. And this mixture probably defined the basis of Staatsvolk. But the secular nature of the Republic also left ample room for non-Sunni Muslims and others. Although, especially at the end of the war of liberation, there was a big amount of distrust in the communities of people who had fought, supported the occupation powers, fought with the occupation powers against the nationalists. Not only the Ottoman establishment and those who supported them, who were also Sunni Muslims, and some of them Turks, but also the non-Muslim religious communities. Therefore, it was perceived that establishing industries in the hands of these Staatsvolk for Turkey was an existential step that needed to be taken. This is the national economy to be established. And of course, the infrastructure of the country was in tatters at the end of the war. The war devastated it, but there wasn't much anyway even before the war. In fact, during the First World War, the Ottomans had great difficulty moving the army from one theater to another, and there were many. From Galicia in the west, Austrian-Hungarian arena of war, to the Sinai Desert in the south, to the Transcaucasus in the east, there were many theaters of war around which the Ottomans had to 
shift their forces, and they had to do it with great difficulty and enormous slowness. Therefore, it was considered that a infrastructure had to be built for defense purposes as well as for economic growth. And the emphasis was put on especially railroads, railroad construction in the beginning. And the agriculture was also deeply hit by the First World War and the War of Liberation, especially in the West. The entire land mass was decimated by the Greek army that was pulling out of the country. And the East was also in awful shape. As you might have recalled, I had read to you earlier the accounts of these two American officials who toured Anatolia in 1919, at the end of the First World War and the beginning of the War of Liberation, and reported that there were huge dislocations of the population, as would have been expected, and also that the economic situation was awful. In certain places, people only had grass to eat. And these people argued that the chances were that a large swath of the population would be starving to death in the winter of 1919. So that was the sta state of affairs that the Republic had to meet. Therefore, there had to be a quick improvement in the state of agricultural production. And therefore, supporting the farmers and creating agricultural development was obviously a basic necessity. And one thing that was missing has always been a problem for the last several centuries for the Ottoman Empire, especially in the 19th century, but also in the 20th, was lack of capital. You needed capital to make investment. And Turkey lacked capital. Severe shortage of capital required that foreign capital be attracted. But at the same time, in the Treaty of Lausanne negotiations, the Turkish nationalists had been adamant in refusing to accept conditions of capitulations and their continuation, and the certain circumstances for uh, good business for foreign capitalists in the country, because they thought that these forces had been also cooperating with the occupation forces during the War of Liberation. So now going back and asking for foreign cap capital would have been very, very difficult. And therefore, they were faced with a um, considerable amount of difficulty. However, they were not against attracting foreign capital. And they were not against rekindling domestic investment by those who had the means to, to invest in the country. And they were not, in any sense of the term, against market economy and market proce procedures for rekindling of business and economic growth. However, come 1929, which ended this period of national economy with free market operations and free trade to a great extent and some form of liberal market processes came to an abrupt end by the occurrence of Great Depression, not in Turkey, but elsewhere, which coincided with the first installment of the Ottoman debt, which was due to be paid in 1929. So this was a very awful accident for the Republican government to face in 1929. The economic situation of the world was going down. The markets were contracting everywhere. And the demand for Turkish exports, which were mainly goat herd hazelnuts, raisins, figs, a little bit of cotton, perhaps. Not much cash cropping either. Of course, these are mostly luxury items. People could do without eating hazelnuts or figs or raisins. 
or even wearing products made out of goat herds. So exports dwindled in a very short period of time. The need for imports, as always, has been very high. So the conditions of global depression and the, a Great Depression and the global recession hit the Turkish market severely. Now that undermined the perception of the market in the eyes of those who were running the Turkish economy and also the Turkish state at the time. The fickleness of the market, its weakness, its easy perturbance by the changes that are not controllable by the events within the country, not by the political leaders or by anyone else in Turkey, for that matter, because this was a global phenomenon, pushed them in a completely different di direction. So they had lost confidence in the markets. And they therefore tried to place their bets, not in the markets, but something which they considered to be much more controllable, which they needed not only to pay back the Ottoman debt, but also to create conditions of economic growth and sustain economic growth for the war-battered country, which they had established the republic on. So they moved for planned, controlled economy and public investment as an engine of development which was called etatism or statism or devletçilik at the time. And it was definitely inspired by what happened in the Soviet Union about the same time as Turkey was moving in this direction. For they discovered that the Soviets, who had developed relatively good relations with the new republic, did not necessarily experience such a great downturn of its economy thanks to its planned and controlled economy. And Turkey had to go for something similar, not communism, not totalitarian one party, which Turkey couldn't run anyway, even if it wanted to, but a one party state in which there is much more economic control from the center. And run the economy so that they could provide for basic needs of the population. Dress them up, provide them shelter, provide them with infrastructure for transportation and movement of goods and ca capital throughout the country as well as individuals. So this, for this purpose, state started to make public investments through banking system which was established by the state. And the state established in this process several banks, for example, Sumer Bank, which produced textiles. Which people could buy at a relatively affordable price and wear for several seasons. Rai Bank, railroad construction, rails, and railroad construction. Eti Bank, mineral excavations, mining. were the sort of main banks that provided investments in these fields. There were also Shekhar Bank producing sugar from beetroots that were produced in the country. Um, some of these banks are still with us, established Halk Bank for the small business. 
uh, and small enterprises. Ziraat Bankası for agricultural banking, which is second largest to the Central Bank of, of Turkey and carried out many of the functions of the Central Bank of Turkey as the second important bank in the country. Suddenly these banks became very important and became part and parcel of the Turkish, the bulk of Turkish manufacturing industry, financing them at the same time. And cooperating with the central bank. Central bank was regulated in 1931, established as an independent autonomous institution in the one party regime of the, of the time with its own law and regulations to control the consumer price inflation. And the foreign trade regime of the country moved away from free trade to regulated trade with permits and permissions for imports and exports monitored by the state more closely under these circumstances. So the country moved from something like national market economy to something like state-controlled public economy due to the influence of the Great Depression. And this continued until 1939. As you very well know, in May 1939, Germany attacked Poland and the Second World War erupted. And this brought the end of this period. And Turkey moved into another period, which we may safely call as the war economy between 1939 and 1945. Turkish government made a very courageous and correct decision not to take part in the war, stay neutral. This is probably the first, first major war the Ottomans didn't take part in. They were part in the Crimean War. They took part in the First World War, but they did not take part in the Second World War. Stayed neutral. Turkey turned into a haven for spies, German, British, Russian, American, you name it. They were sort of moving around, rubbing shoulders, sort of a second Switzerland on the rim of Europe this time, and not participating in the war, and trying to keep a distance as quickly as possible. There have been two attempts in 1942 and 44 by Winston Churchill to involve Turkey in the war. In both occasions, the Turkish authorities asked Mr. Churchill, or Sir Churchill, to prop up the Turkish defenses and invest in Turkish defenses and provide armaments for Turkish military to take part against in this war against Hitler. The panzer divisions of Germany were on the borders of Turkey with Bulgaria and also Greece, which means all the western part of Turkey, completely from the Black Sea to the Maritza River, all the way to the Aegean, down to the Dodecanese Islands. All of them were occupied by the German troops. Therefore, going to war probably meant a push by the German army into Turkey. In fact, until 1942, we know from the archives that the Turkish authorities expected the German army to attack Turkey, go through Anatolian landmass to capture Kirkuk, oil fields. That was one thing that Germany did not have, plenitude of oil for its war effort. And tried its best not to get engaged in this kind of a 
warfare because it was very clear that the German army was no match for the Turkish army. Therefore, the Turkish army could have been easily wiped off. And they couldn't have withstand this kind of push. Um, we still don't know why Hitler did not con consider moving into Iraq through Turkey. And the British also were preparing for an attack from the north, um, coming by the northern part of the Mesopotamia in this war. Actually decided to war against Russia, which was accepted with elation and uh, with great joy by the Turkish authorities when Germany decided to attack Russia instead. It was the oil reserves on, of Russia, which were at stake to a certain extent, or also um, perhaps war glory and what have you. So it was under these circumstances the Turkish war economy evolved. Therefore, the, again, the volume of foreign trade dropped dramatically. Turkey came under pressure from time to time from the allies to get into war. And also, Turkey had to track a very careful course simply because the eastern borders of Turkey had about 640 kilometers borders with the Soviet Union, current borders of, between Turkey and Georgia and Armenia, plus the Russian troops had gone into northern Iraq, I'm sorry, northern Iran, had invaded northern Iran, therefore the eastern part of Turkey was facing the Red Army. And the chances were that the Red Army would also intervene had Hitler decided to attack the Turkish landmass from the east, and the Anatolian Peninsula would have turned into another war zone in the Second World War between the Russian and the German armies. We know the end of the war, that would have meant saving Turkey from Hitler by the Red Army, that either Turkey would have become an Eastern European communist state, or would have been divided along east and west from north to south by the end of the war, more like a Korean situation on one side of Europe under these circumstances, had the British also intervened from the west to somehow control the further expansion of the Red Army. So under these circumstances, all of these scenarios were disastrous scenarios. They would have completely destroyed what had been accumulated until 1939 completely. Therefore, it looked as if it was a crazy moment had Turkey decided to go into war on either side. Later on in the 1950s, the Democrat Party members attacked Ismet Yunani in the Grand National Assembly for his meekness, covered this, and he castrated our manhood, they said. They wanted to have a fight, and that would have proved how manly we were. Dead, but manly. I don't know about you, but my father, serving in the military at the time, would have definitely died. I wouldn't have existed. So the main reason why I existed is because of his maternity, whether, you, whether I like it or not. Your generation is a different story, of course. But the overall impact of the war economy was a severe drop in the production of industrial manufacturing goods. In the year 1938-39, if you take an index of industrial production as 100, at the end of the war it was down to 77. Big drop. There was a, a gush of labor out of industry. They were kept under arms, more than a million people. 
small population at the time. And almost every able man was under arms. Agricultural production fell. Wheat, of course, is the most impo important staple food in the Turkish culture. In Anatolia, people do not invite you to lunch or dinner or a meal. They invite you to eat bread with them. Ekmek yemek. Gel ekmek yiyelim. The rest, other than bread, is just the sort of stuff, stuff that will make the bread a little more tasty. Olives, or cheese, or meat, or aubergine, eggplant, what have you, is sort of an assortment to eating bread. Staple food is bread. We call that katak in Turkish. Not the real thing. The real thing is bread. If you don't eat bread, you're hungry. The rest you may or may not eat. It's not that important. Although now the doctors tell us that we shouldn't, eat, we shouldn't be eating bread, especially the whitest sort of bread. Well, the refined flour, not good for you. Makes you diabetic and make you die earlier than usual. That's not the basic understanding. So wheat production as one cereal is critical. It fell from, again, an index of 100 to 63, even more than industrial production. Therefore, there wasn't good enough flour to make enough bread. The bread quality sucked. Bread started to look dark, not refined properly, had in it not only wheat, but other cereals, rye, barley, etc. And people complained quite a bit. My parents, my in-laws, etc., never ate any bread that wasn't very white all their lives. Not forgetting those five, six years that they had to survive without wheat. So that, it, that, that is a basic value that you have to take into consideration. <clears throat> And of course, the blame fell on the shoulders of the Republican People's Party. Also, the wheat prices as production went down increased sixfold almost from about a level of 100 to 568. When something becomes scarce, if it is in use and there is need for it, its price goes up. Basic. Economics 101, which I'm sure all of you had. It's a matter of supply and demand. So its price went up tremendously. General level of consumer prices increased also of all products, <coughs> almost fourfold during the, those six years. From 100 in 1938-39 to 375. So by November 1942, when Turkey was pressured to get into war with Germany, with these awful circumstances meeting the country, where rationing was rampant, imports fell, exports fell even more. <coughs> also pressures increased. Certain draconian measures had to be taken to be able to feed the military, number one, which is very important. You don't feed the military, military rises up and creates a mutiny. That is more or less what happened in 1917 in Russia. So the first task is to feed the military. As Napoleon had argued, the military walks on its stomach. So it's important, you have to feed them. But these are the most able people who've gotten out of the production line, kept under arms, not very productive, and they have to be fed. So 
you had to find more resources to feed these people and at the same time feed the country to a great extent. And this required more financial resources for the public economy of ethicism to run. So in the years between 1942 and 44, 114,000 taxpayers were asked to pay 315 million Turkish liras in tax. <clears throat> Some forfeited paying tax, 1,400 of them, wouldn't pay or could not pay. They were arrested, sent to prison camps for hard labor in Ashkale, which is in the northeastern part of the country. Huge majority of them happened to be non-Muslims, and therefore they seem to have bore the brunt of this <coughs> wealth tax. This was a tax levied on wealth, not on income, of these people who were accused of being profiteering from the overall rise in consumer prices and the scarcity of goods and contributing to black market operations. So it was assumed that some people were getting filthy rich because of black market operations and some of them were unable to pay their taxes. That it's these 1,400 people out of 114,000 taxpayers. The amount raised amounted to about 3.5% of the GDP and were, was able to finance 38% of the public sector expenditure in total. Since the identity of these people happened to be Jews, Greeks, and Greek Orthodox and Armenian Gregorians, it was considered as having targeted non-Muslim, non staats folk, and was interpreted as increasing amount of nationalization of the business sector of the country under the circumstances. There had been such an impact as such. So this wealth tax became sort of a important boost for the finances of the economy under those circumstances. And it created, of course, a, a harsh set of measures imposed on these people who were who felt mistreated, who lost their belongings, the 1,400, um, and were never able to regain what they had lost. Some of the property that they relinquished or were confiscated from them were sold to, and those who bought them were the staats folk under these circumstances. There's a lot of emphasis being made to it in recent years a big hype about this phenomenon, which is played on as an indication of the kind of rule that the Republican People's Party had in the 1940s, which was received by a um, considerable amount of criticism. However, the other of those 114,000 taxpayers were peasants, farmers. Their wealth were also confiscated. In fact, as the accounts on this goes, these people voluntarily, in some occasions, provided this kind of tax as their support for the war effort under these circumstances. But the peasantry was devastated because of this. So it was not this relatively better off upper classes who were deeply hit that mattered. It was the peasants who lost almost 
half their belongings in a very short period of time, which wasn't much anyway. If you read the book, book by Jahid Kaira, who was involved in collecting these taxes and was a live participant in the process, who has the accounts of this phenomenon, you would get this impression that it was the battered peasants who paid a much higher price than the small group of, well, embedded businessmen who were also devastated by this process. Their wheat production, their cereal production, their agricultural production was confiscated in the name of taxation. Of those people who had two buffaloes, one was confiscated by the state. In some cases, both of them were confiscated. So people went back to tilling land by their own hands and little tools instead of tilling land by animal pulled gadgetry instead, which resulted in even greater failure of the agricultural production under these circumstances. And the consumer prices skyrocketed. Certain commodities were, became scarce in the market where there was rampant black marketeering. And in fact, people lost quite a bit of their purchasing power. They couldn't afford to buy sugar. And they couldn't afford to buy staple food of any sort for a period. And this was played on and on after 1945 when Turkey went into multi-party politics by the opposition against the Republican People's Party. These kinds of measures that had been taken during the war because of that. And there have been many instances which you can read in the accounts of those times and also politics in the 1950s, which was deeply poisoned by these events that happened throughout the Second World War. So 1940s was important for the politics of 1950s. Although the same arguments are being raised over and over again, even in today's Turkish politics, and I watched them and listened to them with amazement. I don't know of the 1940s. What is 1940s to you? You could be talking about 1940 before Christ, you know, so far as I'm concerned. It's prehistory. I, I can't emotionally attach to anything of the sort that could have possibly happened then. But it became a very, very important cultural milestone in Turkish politics creating this perception about the Republican People's Party, which stayed with it until today. Out of which the Republican People's Party never grew up and fully recovered, except for a brief period in the 1970s. Now, post-war economy was a relatively better period where Turkey started to move out of this etatist understanding of running the economy to a more liberal era. As in 1945, at the end of the war, Turkey participated in the establishment of the United Nations, but came under a new international system, mainly controlled by two superpowers, in a bipolar Cold War. And being right next to a superpower, Soviet Union, created new circumstances for Turkey, new threat perceptions, and pushed Turkey in the direction of a more liberal economy under the circumstances, which we had already covered in the previous topics of Turkish decision to become more democratic in its orientation and move for multi-party politics. So 
CHP governments relaxed etatism or statism, began to look for, again, foreign trade and foreign investment, improved circumstances, this time engage with the Club of Democracies as quickly as possible, and eventually Turkey became part of the Marshall Aid Plan of the US and started to receive especially tractors by 1947 and till the land using tractors instead of buffalo pulled machinery and therefore deeper sowing the land produce more minerals which increased the yield in agriculture and there was a big rebound for the Turkish agriculture in the late 1940s all the way to 1954, which incidentally benefited the Democrat Party government after 1950. But at the same time, imports again increased and there became greater pressure on the Turkish lira. So in 1946, Turkish lira was devalued slightly. From over a lira to a dollar, to 2.60 to a dollar. But the main benefit after 1988, 1948 was the mechanization of agriculture. And after the Democrat Party came to power, with a campaign province of liberal economy, free trade, private enterprise, and privatization, Turkey moved towards liberal market practices in early 1950s. And with agricultural production increasing, not only because of, only of mechanization, more fertilizer use and what have you through American imports, but also with good weather, harsh winters, a lot of snow, blanketed cereal fields with snow, producing a lot of nutrients for the cereals to grow, produced record harvests. And with the Democrats came plenitude, bereket. Agriculture grew by 13% per annum between 1950 and 1954. And the vote share of the Democrat Party also grew, as you know, from 1950 to 1954. It looks as if there is a correlation in between, probably a causation as well. However, Turkey got into a recession soon after, in 1955-56. And therefore, this free trade practice could no longer be sustained. Turkey went back to protectionism in its foreign trade, public sector investment as the engine of growth was reinstituted as private initiative started to find less opportunities for itself to grow. And Turkey started to introduce import substitution policies, therefore supporting those sectors of the economy where basic needs were identified so that manufacturing of those commodities could be done domestically so that Turkey would become less dependent on imports for the basic industrial needs of the country. By 1957, right after the elections, Turkey had one of the sharpest devaluation of the Turkish lira, where the value of the Turkish lira dropped by 330% overnight, as one dollar became nine Turkish liras. But it didn't stop the scarcities and black market practices to, to restart again in 19, after 1957. Now those I remember as a child. You could not purchase more than a certain gram of cheese or you could not find more than a certain amount of sugar even if you had the money. That was rationing. For there were scarcities, not enough to go around in that period. 
That had contributed to the dwindling of the purchasing power of the salaries of the bureaucrats, especially officials of the state, which increased, of course, bribery and corruption of routine interactions with the bureaucracy on the one hand, and also contributed to this feeling of having lost power in the society in the eyes of the military. You had a question? What is the reason of the 1955 and 56 recession? Well, the weather conditions were not that good, so the agricultural production decreased. There was a little contraction in the markets that Turkey was exporting to at the same time. So there was a contraction of the economy. Besides, economies contract from time to time due to business cycles. So 48, 55, seven years. So there was a seven year business cycle which ended and Turkish economy began to contract again under these circumstances. And the right kind of policies could not be taken and adaptation to these conditions could not be made by the government for the government had not assumed that there would be such a downturn at the time. They were ill-prepared and failed to adjust and adapt to these changes. So they suffered the consequences in the 1957 elections. And the economy suffered the consequences afterwards, um, all the way to 1961. So the loss of economic capability and also loss of prestige due to loss of economic capability by the bureaucrats increased and strained, uh, increase this feeling of being um, sort of stigmatized by the Democrat Party government, which was considering the bureaucrats to be a part of the old center and treating them as the enemies. And at the same time, the strains and hostilities between them, especially the military bureaucrats and the Democrat Party government increased. Yes. They did use it effectively it in agriculture and also in building roads, but some port facilities, etc. They, they Turkey didn't have the chances of increasing its growth rate any higher and sustain it for a longer period of time. Yes, that is true. That was ran into limits and could not increase it any further because the industrial base wasn't that good and the um, and there were bottlenecks, which I will turn to, which they had not realized until a new state planning um, organization was established in 1961 and start making calculations for the first time. And with the 1961 constitution, Turkey established a state planning organization, which was believed that from now on, we can therefore prepare for shocks due to these plans and take the necessary steps to avoid them as much as we, we can. And not repeat the same thing that happened in 1955 ever again. And therefore go down a economic recession that precipitated social unrest, that created political instability, that increased the conflict between the political parties further, and that paved the way for the breakdown of a democracy. And to avoid that and somehow prevent that kind of spiral from taking place again. The framers of the 1961 constitution thought that establishing a state planning organization where there could be some kind of planning and the governments following these plans made by economic technocrats could then put Turkey on a more sure footing in 1961. And first five year development plan got into, into action in 1962. In this plan, these areas or sectors of the economy were considered as central industrial sectors to be promoted, focused on, and would be made the major engine of growth. Textiles, food, and processed agricultural products. Well, textiles and food are processed also. Processed agricultural products mean that you don't simply trade them raw, but do something about it. 
you know, get tomatoes, squeeze them into paste, and sell them as paste. That's processed food for you. Okay? Or get cereals, make flour, make bread out of them, and sell them as bread, or, or cookies, or whatever. That's all processed food, processed agriculture product. Or, you know, have some kind of manufactured textiles, for example. Or build anything out of agricultural production. You know, squeeze olives and get olive oils and sell them instead of selling olives. Just picking them up from the branches of an olive tree and selling them. So this is what was considered to be the first big step in the direction of using agricultural inputs to manufacture processed agricultural products, textiles and food especially. In this first plan, bottlenecks were discovered. Turkey had scarcity of three things. Two of them got a lot of attention in the plan. One is a reliable source of energy and natural resources out of which Turkey could generate its needs for energy for economic growth. That is a bottleneck. And the plan tried to sh find ways of overcoming this difficulty. Second bottleneck, human capital. Education was lagging behind. Turkey didn't have enough skilled labor, didn't have enough engineers, didn't have enough doctors, didn't have enough architects, didn't have enough lawyers, didn't have enough professionals could not provide enough education to its up and coming young population. That's the second bottleneck. And these have to be addressed, the plan called to the attention of the politicians, and this had to be made. And these emerged as critical political problems for Turkey and economic constraints for Turkey during the Yom Kippur War of 1973 and what followed as OPEC cartels, sanctions, and a huge price hike in oil, and also in the 1974 Cyprus War, Turkey ran into great difficulty finding jet fuel, which Turkey was only able to get from Gaddafi's Libya at the time for a very cheap price that it could afford to get under these circumstances. So these sort of constraints that the plan called for, which were still bottlenecks 10 years later, created a huge difficulty for the government at the time. And when the oil embargo and arms embargo coincided, Turkey found itself in a really big gridlock of some sort so far as its economic growth was concerned and also its overall performance of its economy and political relations were concerned under the circumstances after the Cyprus War of 1974, which we have already covered, as you very well know. So the Turkish exports, imports, and the trade deficit became Again, a major economic problem as exports stayed more or less stable, around $700, $800 million, whereas imports suddenly increased over to several billions, with the oil bill increasing to about $3 billion alone. So the Turkish exports could not even pay for the importation of oil under these circumstances. Turkish foreign trade collapsed by 1978-79. It was at that time that when Süleyman Demirel became the prime minister again in 1979 and was asked about getting something like $70 million from OECD or whatever, and whether Turkey needed that much or not, he said Turkey needs even 70 cents today. So it looked as if Turkish foreign reserves were flat 
by that time. And Turkey went back to rationing. You could only buy a certain amount of gasoline or diesel for your car or tractor or minivan or bus by 1979. We had been issued of these rationing uh, documents. They were signed and sealed every time we got some gasoline. And in fact, uh, you had to wait for long hours to get gasoline from the gas stations. And there were long lines of cars waiting to get gasoline from midnight. And there was a lot of gossip that there is new gasoline showing up in some part of the city. So you would dash there in 2 AM in the morning, get in line and wait for it until next afternoon and get some gasoline for your car. That's more or less the standard. And this was true for the entire public transport system as well. So the minibuses that ran in the Dolmuc system, et cetera, came under enormous amount of stress under these circumstances. And that was, there was good reason, therefore, to vote the Republican People's Party out again from government in 1979. And in the minds of the people, therefore, rationing and the Republican People's Party government sort of correlated. It happened in 1942. It happened in 1979. Again. And that reinforced the image of the Republican People's Party as one that cannot manage the economy properly. But the big decision came on the 24th of January 1980 as a governmental decree, not as a law. Governmental decree with the force of law that ended the controls of the free market economy and put the export-led growth into real effect. This was actually expert-led growth idea had been ushered in by Teoman Köprüler of the Republican People's Party in 1978. But it stayed as a raw idea until it was put into action after these reforms in 1980. Of course, the result was a spiraling of prices of basic commodities. Now you could find these commodities that were hoarded by the grocers, green grocers, supermarkets of, of, of the country on the shelves again, but at a very high price. And you could buy them only if you could afford them. So for a lot of people, now scarcity was over, but these goods were still out of reach. They could no longer consume it at the levels that they had consumed them before 1978. But with high price inflation, at least scarcity was over with, and it was possible to start the process of growth again after 1980. These measures met with some stiff resistance by the workers, trade unions especially, who found the prices too high for their salaries, and they asked for wage increases accordingly. So until that time, unheard of wage increase demands started to come up. 100%, 120% wage increases, which could not be afforded by the businesses. And the industrial piece came under another stress because of that at this time. And it was at that juncture that we had a military coup, which suppressed all of these demands, crushed the labor union movement from 3.5 million trade union members of an economy with about 5 million workers. Turkey moved to a labor union, labor union movement of about 1 million members with 11 million workers in 2013. So that is the difference. And this is accomplished if it's an accomplishment by the military. It was the military government that destroyed the trade unions in Turkey. It's, it is with this destruction that this new period of liberal market economy with weak labor organizations, flexible hiring and firing, which of course on the one hand resulted in 
severe violations of human rights of the workers, but on the other hand, produce a Turkish miracle of growing again after 1980. So we are now in this new Shangri-La of liberal market economy, which is hugged by all major forces except for the older labor unions which are gone. Turkey experienced between 2080 and 2007 something the economists believe was impossible. High consumer high and stable consumer price inflation. Consumer prices increased per annum between 65 to 85 percent. Huge, by any standards. The economic theories of our colleagues indicate that when you get into that kind of terrain, you go on to triple digit, which Turkey had from time to time, under Tansu Çiller, for example, in 1993-1994. The country decided to go on to printing huge amounts of money instead of borrowing and we had 125% per annum consumer price inflation. Then it's expected that you go into hyperinflation. 10,000% per annum, 100,000% per annum. Argentina, for example. Many Latin American countries experience that. Now, there is some theorizing among the economists that this is made possible when you have strong labor unions. Turkey didn't have strong labor unions, therefore checking up the inflation rate by protecting their wages against this kind of decimation was not possible. Therefore people suffered, they lost purchasing power, they lost prosperity, they gave in their economic welfare, but they could not under these circumstances, effectively engage in labor disputes with the employers and jack up the prices any further. As a result of which, Turkey was able to keep the high inflation rate stable within bounds of 60% to 80% for this period until 2007, when due to the circumstances of that time, Turkey was able to drop the inflation rate to single digit from 2007 onwards. In this period, of course, Turkey had a new constitution in 1982, back to multi-party politics, and of course, the end of the Cold War, which coincided with the increasing threat of the PKK as a major force, first asking for some kind of secession from Turkey, and then eventually asking for more rights and some kind of a glorious autonomy from Turkey, and sometimes also demanding some kind of major changes in the regime of the country, and soon after, with 1991 and 1995 elections, political Islam became new emerging forces and new challenges for what Turkey ha have had up until that point in time. And we had a new Turkish political regime from that period onward, where these two forces began to have more say in the affairs of the country. But also the natural disasters of 1999, the earthquakes of August and November, devastated the northeastern, northwestern part of the country especially Izmit area to our east. Well, you can get into Izmit if you walk from this campus and walk out, turn left, keep walking. In about a, probably 10 to 15 minutes, you'll be in Kojeli, the next province. 
And Kojele is the manufacturing mecca of Turkey, where you have a huge investment of most manufacturing plants in that part of the country. And that was deeply hit by the earthquakes, 7.6 on the Richter scale, ripped through the industry and devastated that industry. Um, somewhere around 18,000 buildings collapsed fully. Just like pancakes, they call it. One on top of the other, leaving not much room in between, smashing large numbers of people. Official death toll is about 18,000. My humble estimate is probably about five times as much. Died. There were many casualties, but there were also many more who were injured. Whole families were wiped off. And that had a big impact on the way things began to move in the country. And the um, industrial output of Turkey was deeply battered by these developments in 1999, which coincided with the almost simultaneously with the establishment of a new government, a coalition government, which was battered by the events of 1999. In November 1999, the fourth largest bank in Turkey, Demirbank, was caught with too much liquidity. I'm sorry, too few liquidity in its vaults. And when people tried to withdraw money from the bank, they couldn't. They couldn't give, provide them enough cash. Why the central bank has not, had not provided enough cash for this bank to, to continue on being buoyant is anybody's guess. But the um, bank collapsed eventually, was eventually sold to HSBC in Turkey. So HSBC became a major bank in Turkey almost overnight because of this purchase. In 2000, there was a repetition almost of this crisis as new measures were taken to improve the tax base of the Turkish economy. There was a big reaction from the business community who resisted these measures and the financial situation suddenly became again very fragile under these circumstances in 2000. But the real crisis came in a year later in 2001 where 16 banks out of 89 banks collapsed almost overnight, three more later on, increasing to 19 banks in total, where about $40 billion were, were lost, which was approximately about, if I'm not mistaken, 10% of the GDP at the time. Several major corporations got into difficulty. Youth unemployment reached 14.6% in 2001, which was considered a crisis. Of course, if you've seen the last figures about youth unemployment today, it's approximately 16%, so larger today than it was then. It was considered a crisis then. It's not considered a crisis today. It's called perception management. The economic situation and the meltdown and the huge battering created new circumstances in which the prime minister of the time, Mr. Bülent Ecevit, asked Professor Kemal Dervish from the World Bank to come over to the rescue of the economy. His rescue plan was to negotiate with the IMF and the World Bank, a new standby agreement with the IMF, um, get some more loans from the US, which Turkey was able to get. Uh, in the meantime, have full flotation of the Turkish Lira as, and make it convertible as it is today. You have no difficulty getting your foreign currencies converted into TL anywhere nowadays. Whereas you needed to have uh, some kind of reason to 
make this conversion earlier, no longer. So full flotation of the Turkish lira became possible. New financial agencies were established, autonomous from the government of the time. Fund of Savings and Capital, TMSFE, Tasarruf Mevduatı Sermaye, Tasarruf Mevduatı Sigorta Fonu, I'm sorry. Tasarruf Mevduatı Sigorta Fonu, Fund of Savings and Capital, that's their official English version, and Council of Banking Control and Regulation, BDDK as it is known, and um, these agencies and others began to go through the accounts of these collapsed banks, collect their, some of the loans that they had given out. Uh, not collectible loans were written off. Some of these banks were pulled together and new banking structures were established and they were put on sale and they were sold to new capital. And the Darwish plan uh, started to work by 2002 and Turkey was again on the growth path after it, uh, its growth rate was minus 6% in 2001. Yes, that, but after Dervish, Dervish came, flotation became, I mean, there was some kind of managed flotation earlier. That managed flotation was made full flotation. And liberal market practices were um, established on some kind of solid ground, especially the financial sector was regulated through these agencies and other agencies more effectively. Um, some kind of steps were taken to regulate competition. So a competition board was established. Uh, capital markets were also organized and regulated um, by the introduction of other regulatory bodies. So there was a lot of autonomous regulatory bodies which were run by uh, bureaucrats chosen on meritocratic grounds, uh, uncontrolled by the majorities in the Grand National Assembly and the politicians as such, which as you may easily imagine is no longer the case. We went back to that control mold again after a brief period of about um, nine years after 2011, all of this has, has been turned around completely. Now, in 2002, at the end of it, Justice and Development Party came to government. In about five years, or four years rather, it, the consumer price inflation rate finally fell to single digit as this program between Turkey, IMF, World Bank, and domestically established were left intact by the Justice and Development Party who did not try to uh, tinker with it or change it in any way and establish the controls that it has established now over the economy then and kept this working regulations and mechanisms in place and make them do their magic. And indeed, they continued on working and produced um, growth for Turkey between 2003 and 2007, 2008, I'm sorry. So this period is considered to be again a golden period in general by the businesses and by also the voters in general in Turkey, which may be, for example, considered just like the early 50s under the Democrat Party, and reinforce the image that right-wing politicians can provide working conditions for the macroeconomy and manage the affairs of the country better. So economic growth increased under these circumstances. Exports and imports increased to new heights. Turkey started to export 
over $100 million, billion dollars a year. The record was, I think, 132 or $33 billion a few years ago. But its imports also increased even more, went close to $200 billion in the meantime. Especially inputs and machinery is required for increases in manufacturing and also energy is required for higher growth for Turkey. All of them are imported as a result of which as Turkey grows more rapidly, imports grow more rapidly with it and the trade deficit increases. If, you, if the governments want to decrease trade deficit, then they have to increase exports without importing much, which they haven't found a means of doing so yet, or they try to decrease growth rate so that the gaping deficit gets less. Turkey still today has close to 6% of the GDP as, this, as its trade deficit, which is one of the highest in the world currently, and has been so for a very long period of time. Not in terms of volume, but in terms of percentage to the GDP, mind you. Turkey had a brief financial crisis in 2006, which did not create any major problems. But in 2008, IMF austerity package ended in May. And the government declared that we owe very little to IMF and we can pay it off. And indeed, Turkey paid off what it owed to IMF completely. Now, this doesn't mean that Turkey doesn't have any foreign debt, but it has some foreign debt, uh, which is not too much. Uh, it is within the Maastricht criteria. It's like somewhere around 40 to 50 percent of the GDP. Um, $528 billion, if I'm not mistaken, the total debt. So it's not a big, big deal. Um, the public debt within that is about 300 plus billion dollars. A private debt is about 200 plus um, billion dollars. Then Turkey started to experience the famous global recession that all of us are going through right now in 2008, 2009. In the first quarter, of 2009, Turkey started to experience a huge contraction, minus 14% growth. And that also was converted into political downturn for the Justice and Development Party of that year. On the 30th of March 2009 elections, they lost a chunk of their votes and they dropped down to 38% of the participating voters vote in that election, local election. But in 2010, Turkey regained rapid growth, which continued until 2011. In 2011 elections, again, there was a dividend that came out of this growth for Justice and Development Party, as voters consisted, consistently thought that 2008-9 was a fluke just like 2006, and this, is, this will, grow, will grow over it, and then delivered about 49.8% of their vote for the Justice and Development Party, which won the elections for three times in a row. Now, in 2010, of course, the uh, Eurozone in Europe started to show signs of enormous slowing down, creating severe problems, especially in the South, as Greece, Spain, Portugal, Ireland, Italy started to experience these downturns. Uh, a new, all, these are sort of acronyms for some countries, you know, Brazil, Russia, India, and China. BRIC. Uh, this is harder for me to remember now. It's not been used for a while. T here is Turkey. S is South Africa. C, I think, is Colombia. E is Egypt, which is not in good shape. V is Vietnam. I is, I think, Indonesia. BRICS, civets. And they started to call these southern European example pigs. Portugal, Ireland, Greece, Spain. Going down the drain. 
and with it the Eurozone experiencing huge problems. And all of these countries started to experience dropping growth rates now. And Turkey started to experience again a trend towards rising consumer price inflation and increasing trade imbalance. Uh, Turkey almost has a double digit inflation rate now. Again, consumer price inflation is about 9.8% per annum, more or less. We'll see what it turns out at the end of this month when the Turkish Statistics Institute will announce the consumer price inflation figures. We'll know for sure what it will be. But until the end of November, year, year on year, it was about 9.8% per annum, very close to double digit. Um, unemployment continued to be an unresolved issue for Turkey, still high. It hovered around 10%, sometimes went up to 11, 12% gross, but at the same time, urban unemployment went almost up to 20%. Youth unemployment went up to, again, close to 20%, 16 to 20% in this period. And at the same time, some, some of the labor was relocated, went back into agriculture, is now coming out of it again and moving into the bigger cities once more. Economic growth slowed down after 2011. 12, 13, 14, all of these, the last three years, the average will be around 3% per annum. For the BRICS, it's about 5%. So it looks as if the, um, the gap between BRICS, except for perhaps Brazil, is becoming larger between Turkey and these countries, not growing very rapidly. Consumer inflation, consumer price inflation is again showing signs of some difficulty. And there seems to be a big real estate bubble emerging, um, creating a huge debt problem for increasing number of people. And the number of uh, ads, commercials, sales of apartment units and houses increase every time we approach an election. If you look at the papers today, and we're about six months from election, they are replete with, you know, various real estate production projects, construction here and there. They are for sale. And you see all sorts of enticing offers by these corporations. You know, pay 2,000 Turkish lira a month and you will own a certain apartment in somewhere in Istanbul sort of thing. Um, it looks as if there is a push for increasing sales. That, of course, create debt problems for a lot of people. And the debt problem grows. Whether th that debt can be serviced or not is an economic problem. But politically, it may be wise to follow such a policy because indebted people usually are not revolutionary. They tend to keep the status quo going. And it's a good major economic motive to continue on voting for, the, for stability, in essence. The higher the debt, the more it is, until the debt bubble bursts. Then it's a disaster, as it happened in the pigs, as we very well know, as well as in the US and Britain and a host of other countries where real estate bubble burst. And a lot of financial collapse emerged because of that. Um, there's a lot of debate about whether Turkey is experiencing a real estate bubble or not, uh, but the economists are not very sure. The jury is out on that question, so I can't say that there's a bubble, so there's a question mark here as well. The three major pressing bottlenecks that have been with us from the very beginning are still with the Turkish economy and deeply influences Turkish politics today. Turkey has a bottleneck of human resources. 9% of the population above the age of 25 
have any higher education in this country, 9%. 5.2 million people have diplomas from four years of higher education programs. 90% has not had any experience with college education in the country, which is very, very small. For any of the goals that Turkey has established for itself, sustained economic growth, becoming a larger economy, becoming a top 10 economy in the world, etc. It would be a miracle if Turkey manages that. Totally a miracle, unforeseen. With 9% of the population out of colleges, that's a long shot. There's a huge uneducated group of people, a vast majority, who haven't had any college education or secondary education in the country. Approximately 45% of the people are so low in their skills that they cannot be employed at any point in time in any line of business. Unemployable. How much? 45%. Approximately. Huge majority of them are women. Women's labor participation rate is either 28 or 29 percent, depending on who you believe in. Less than 30 percent. This is labor participation rate, not employment. Those above the age of 15. That's the ILO's threshold for legal employment. For men, it's about 78%. That's again, not very high. There is a huge swath of the population that are unemployable. So that is a, a huge human resource bottleneck for Turkish economy. This has stayed more or less stable for a very long time in time, in, in the past. A lot more women had been considered as participating in the labor force, which was close to about 50% once upon a time, because they were in agriculture. So those families who were living in the rural areas and villages were considered as being employed, even though these women were employed at home. But in statistics, these people were considered as contributing in the production in the field, to a certain extent, or tending the animals at the farm, etc., and therefore they were considered as being employed. Once they came to the cities, they do more or less the same sort of things. They're not considered employed any longer. So the percentage dropped almost by half to about 22%. Then in recent years, due to new, some, some new practices, of, for example, providing the opportunity of being employed as a health aide if there is a disabled person in the family, the mother or the sister is looking after this person. So that increased the statistics by about five to six percentage points for women who are employed. And that put them up to about 28, 29%. Still, very low. So this human resource capability seems to be relatively shallow and has been a major bottleneck for the economic growth of the country. So Turkey will either invest heavily in skillful education, provide large amount of people with skills, higher education, more like one third of the population with diplomas out of universities, etc., or it will not meet any of its goals in the foreseeable future, period. And currently, it's doing nothing to accomplish this that is worth any mention. There are some developments, but they are meager developments that seem to be happening. Um, the number of colleges increased in Turkey to, up to over 170. 
more people are employed. However, the measurements made by educational experts, OECD's proficiency in scholastic aptitude tests, PISA tests, indicate that only about 5 to 15,000 15, students can get proper instruction in the secondary schools of Turkey to attend college, where Turkey graduates approximately close to 300,000 students from secondary schools. Very small percentage of them are college educationable. Many of them leave the country, go to the United States, Canada, Australia, Europe for higher education also. Of these, five to 15,000. Leaves with a sliver of people who can get decent education in college. Therefore, quality-wise, there are severe problems so far as these human resources are concerned. And this is an economic bottleneck. Identified in 1961, in 2014, it's part and parcel of our problem. That is why education is a very important issue. Turkey is discussing this, but not providing any solution to it at any point in time. Secondly, natural resources. Turkey's natural resources, especially energy resources, are very, very few. And therefore, it has to import natural resources. And this is a bottleneck. Steps taken in this direction has not solved any of the major problems facing Turkey. This issue is on the books, staying on the books, gets no solution to this day, as far as we can, we can tell. It's still an impediment for rapid and sustainable rapid growth for Turkey. Something happens with the fossil fuels as it does today. Prices go down, prices go up, Quantities get larger or smaller, Turkish economy is deeply battered by all these changes in the international market. And a development that, the, that Turkey cannot control. Thirdly, financial resources. Turkey has had, since 1923, very little financial resource at its disposal for investments. Two years ago, there was a big debate again in the press, pointing our attention to this, upon the revelations of a state minister in charge of the economy, who argued that the savings rate in Turkey is 12% of income. 12%. One of the lowest on earth. This is the savings rate. Some argue that it's even a highly exaggerated figure. It's single digit in Turkey. That is, it looks as if people who live in Turkey live as if there is no tomorrow. They're not putting any money aside. They're not taking care of, they're not thinking about their pension funds, living into an old age, etc. They are spending like crazy in the newly built mall shopping centers. Spend, spend, spend, spend, spend. And there was such a commercial, some of you may have noticed, about six months ago. A guy with a lot of cash in his hands going around, throwing around, as a typical you know, Turkish consumer. And this has always been law. It has stayed law, and it is staying law. Now you have to increase this. Now it's Considered to be low, for example, in the United States, which is approximately 25%, twice as much. China is 35%. Japan, 50%. Turkey is nowhere close to any of this. And it's very difficult to increase this to, that, to those levels. You know, it's not just a percentage you can write on the board and hope to increase. It requires fundamental change of behavior. And these do not necessarily happen very easily. And there is all this push for consumption in Turkey, creating a consumer society out of Turkey. The good times are here. You know, spend more. Get more debt. Use your credit card. Don't worry about paying it. 
No. Comes at a price at the same time. But we have always had this problem. This is nothing new. Not created by the current government. Not sold by the current government, but not created by it. This was with us at the time of the collapse of the Ottoman Empire, at the beginning of the Republic, and still with us. Not necessarily. We don't have that high an inflation rate, especially currently. And we didn't have a very high inflation rate all the time. We had high inflation rates and then low inflation rates. This was a phenomenon between 1980 and 2007. So for that period, you can make that argument. But earlier, when we have lower inflation rates in the 60s, we still had that problem. In fact, this was diagnosed in the first plan in 1961. In fact, in 1923, when we first established the Republic, in the first economic congress, this was a major issue in Izmir, which met right at the start of the Republic in 1923 in Izmir. And when they discussed these issues, it was a problem then. But this requires a complete change on your lifestyle, your understanding. You're not going to go after the next best cellular phone, next best TV screen at your home, next best car, change your car every other year, whatever. No. Change your lifestyle. Become more humble. And these things are not very easy to change. I'm not arguing that you, know, you can do it within one government's tenure or something like that. It's not that easy. This requires a totally different sort of mindset for people. For example, the Japanese can't spend anymore. The Japanese governments have been at a reverse constraint. They are trying to rekindle their economy, make it grow. It would grow if people would, were to spend, but the Japanese won't spend. So instead, the government spends. They have been involved in, in this quantitative easing way before the United States. For the last, if I'm not mistaken, 28 years, they've been continuing with this quantitative easing. Again, today, Japanese Central Bank is pumping huge amounts of yen into the market to create growth. Could have been easily solved had the Japanese dropped their investment rates to our rates. They come out of the mess that they're in. They're in constant recession for the last 20 years. They can't get out of it. They lost their second place in the world to China because of that, because they can't grow. But the consumers sit on their money. Even when there was negative, negative interest rate on the capital. You put some money in the bank, the money cut a commission for keeping your money safely, not paying you any, any interest on it. So the interest rates were negative. But cut 2%, 3% out of your salary, out of the money you invested in, the, in a bank account and kept it there for a while, per annum. So even then, they wouldn't spend more. Hang on to their savings. These are not easy to change behavior that you have to take into consideration. Probably out of these three, human resources are the easiest to fix. Probably in a generation, if you follow the right kind of policies of educating people en masse and pushing more people through better quality college education, have more of these people in manufacturing employed because of improved skills. That's a possibility. Well, that requires considerable amount of emphasis on such programs as engineering, basic science, et cetera, et cetera. This is not where, we, where Turkey seems to be going under the current government. So again, this is not created by the current government. This is something they inherited, but they're not doing anything to improve the standard of Turkey on that. They're simply doing just the opposite, so far as I can tell. So it looks as if the problems are not going to be solved for a long time to come. For those of you who are going to work in this market, 
and produce in this market, be employed in this market, keep these three in mind. You'll be living with these. They're not going to go away. When I was first introduced to them as bottlenecks in Turkey, I was an undergraduate student in an economics program at Istanbul University in 1969. How many years has passed? 45. They're still with me. I'm teaching you the same thing today. So 45 years from now, one of you may be doing the same thing, unless the governments do something about it. So this, therefore, is pretty much the kind of story we have. So we started out with market economy, free trade, moved into etatism, moved into liberal free trade again, moved into import substitution for a long while, then in 1980, that, that collapsed, that policy collapsed, we moved into something like a liberal market economy again, and we're simply going with that kind of um, practice today in a crony capitalist, almost neo-corporatist controlled economy as a structure uh, currently. And that, that seems to be where we have been. 